Hello, my name is John Polk and thanks for dropping by. I'm going to be reading to you from a book that I wrote, Love Marketing, The New Reality. And I'm starting with Chapter 2, Aspects of the New Reality. And somewhere in here you're going to hear me talk about the love economy. I think that's where we are right now. And we have the tools and the vehicles to facilitate love marketing in this love economy. And you'll notice that I mentioned Gary Vaynerchuk in the title, the Thank You Economy. And I think the Thank You Economy is great. I love Gary. But love marketing, the love economy, I think is the next level beyond that. So if you'd like to succeed in business or just be a happier person and understand the psychology and the dynamics of the new world economy, the love economy, then, then listen as I read to you. And I will say... I might make a mistake here and there. I'm not trying to have this as a professional recording, you know, to be in a audiobook. I'm reading to you from the heart and sharing with you a, a book that I wrote, and I hope that somehow you and I get to know each other better. And you know, with the way we're connected now through social media, it's not a hard thing to do. So I look forward to hearing from you, tweeting with you, visiting with you, and talk to you soon. Here we go. In the future chapters, by the way, you won't have to hear all this. So here we go. Chapter 2, Aspects of the New Reality. Even before we get into the new reality, I want to make two positive changes right now. We no longer want to use the terms customer retention and customer acquisition. As a sidebar, you'll note that one of the things I seek to do is to redefine the language of business to be more current instead of the old archaic metaphors. Back to the book. I will explain this a little later, but from here on out, we will be calling these motivations customer preservation and customer receiving. As you will discover along the way, the words we use are intrinsic in creating the realities in which we live. Chances are what you have been confronted with is the lifetime value of your customers is shrinking and margins are eroding. In short, the multiplying effect is headed in the wrong direction. Well then, as entrepreneurs, we obviously have to turn this around. We need to decrease the costs of customer preservation and customer receiving. While we will be covering ways of doing this, this book is not about the mechanics of change in the ordinary sense. The major focus of this book's book is to humanize the machine. We'll be getting into this momentarily. For now, I believe we should look at some of the challenges that have occurred just over the past 15 years. I will add here that these changes alone are enough to stir us into positive human action, into creating our own changes. Going back only 15 years, we could run an infomercial and virtually put any product on and sell a zillion of them, but now we can't do this. Today, the truth is it's more like a miracle to create a successful infomercial or ad campaign where the customer receiving costs, meaning customer acquisition, in case you've forgotten, is not prohibitive. And so the question pops out of the frying pan and into the fire of despairing over what is going to happen in the next 10 or 15 years. For sure, there are going to be more companies, more products, more Me Too-isms, and the commoditization of everything is going to become heavier and heavier. Note, I made that word up, commoditization. It doesn't exist, but it sure sounds good. It can be said without too much hesitation that everything has become a commodity from bottled water to canned air. You can get the same product down the street for the same price, and so, like the old gray mare, the competitive way of doing business just ain't what she used to be. We are in a time frame when it is not only important to compete wisely, but it is essential to compete in positive, productive ways. And in this view, I want to give you yet another turn to make part of your new vocabulary, non-combative competing. It's a tongue twister. 
This will eventually bring us to an extremely vital topic of the entire message of this writing. So please, just make a mental note. Non-combative competing. As this will soon play a role in your own success story. For now, however, it is necessary to know that in order to arrive at a new reality, we need to know exactly what direction we're taking. And so let's imagine for a moment that we're standing at a crossroad and there are two road signs. One reads war marketing and the other love marketing. Which road do you take? The chances are that you will have the intuition to take the love marketing direction, but you may fear that love and business are pretty strange bedfellows. But why is this? Love is positive, after all, and that which is positive most naturally produces positive results. Nevertheless, the truth is that you have been seduced by the ideas and concepts that business is war. This is how it has been portrayed. Indeed, you've been taught, trained, and engineered to believe in the survival of the fittest, that the strongest, biggest, and most powerful are the winning players, the celebrating gladiators of the marketplace, and you believe a reason you're not among them is because you don't have the weapons to fight your way to the top. Maybe you don't put it this way. But down deep in the soul of you, you want to be the predator too and be able to fight the grand battles and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with your competition. And the chances are that you try in your own way. Perhaps you call meetings and talk about targeting accounts, creating strategies that will capture your clients and building ad campaigns that will somehow have more recruitment appeal than those ads and or commercials you're running against. In fact, it is not unusual for leadership to call where they gather their marketing teams or sales force for meetings, the war room. Meet with just about any business owner, CEO or devoted manager and ask him or her how they are intending to grow their business or in some cases to merely stabilize its operations and you will generally hear something like we're putting together our attack plan together now uh, or we've launched our biggest bomb so let's see where they land. And so you stand at the crossroad of love and war. The warring route will tend to make you more sense to you. It did for me for years. In fact, one of my favorite metaphors came from the saying that tells us that when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Well, this seems to be po a positive attitude, but tough is to determined as aggressive is to assertive. The love marketer is determined and assertive, which are positive and productive attributes. The problem is that today, both men and women in business keep believing that business has to be about being tough and aggressive. Ask just about anyone in business how things are going, and the odds are that you will get an answer that is something like still fighting the battles or just taking one day at a time, seeing how the war goes. Okay, points made. Typically, business continues in the old reality of war metaphors and paradigms. There is a new reality, however, and it is entering the consciousness of the consumer in massive proportions. And this is not only here, true, here at home, but globally. I'm not talking about politics. I'm talking about people. Based on this observation, I'm going to risk losing some readers at this juncture because I want to share my passions about the new love economy. I think it is important enough to take the risk, even though I am well aware that at least some readers, readers who have opened this book will be stoic business people, unprepared for and skeptical of what I am about to say. If you should be such a person, I hope that you will read on anyway. Because, as I keep saying, what I am so anxious to share with you can 
and will create great and wonderful changes for you and for your business. Here we go. Since the age of so-called enlightenment, we human beings have been growing farther apart from ourselves and so others. The paradigms that we were given to us by science are that we live in a dead and mechanical world. As a result, our great human quest has been to control nature. Consequently, we lost our connectedness to the universe and to our own hearts. The mind became all and we were taught that maturity is about controlling our feelings and reacting to cold calculations to the world around us. If you want to succeed in life, you have to be tough, hard and aggressive. You have to win by beating, defeating the competition. And so we were raised up in the concepts that told us that we better be willing to step on a few toes before we were stepped on or over by others. Amidst this basic training of our becoming, we grew up believing that the only real goals of life were getting ahead, winning the races and grabbing the brass ring. All these metaphors belong to big business no less than they have belonged to conquering armies since the advent of civilization itself. As I pointed out earlier, you no doubt connect to these metaphors also. After all, the world has been turning on them for a very long time. In the end, we, in general, have lost meaning and purpose in our lives and, by and large, have become either soft or hard materialist to one degree or another. Over the past few decades, however, the new science called quantum physics or quantum mechanics has been suggesting that there is more to life much more than what we have been told at least since the time of Descartes. Incidentally, the new physics are not so new anymore. They have been around a little over a hundred years, beginning with Max Planck's theorem, theory of quantum in 1900. The philosopher and mathematician Descartes gave us a world model that told us that the universe was a mere machine. And from this view eventuated the soul-less, spiritual-less, life-less view of classical science that has been centered in the belief that the universe evolved accidentally and that all living things, including ourselves, are a result of that ancient accident. In short, our human value has been scientifically compared to the value of a pebble on the beach. Indeed, according to classical science, there's no essence to us at all. Only our physical attributes that by some odd chance include an incredible mechanism called a brain. I'll go further into this on a later page, but for now, the point being made is simply that the new science is telling us that the old views are not correct. That the perception of I am here and you are there and the trees of the forest are over there is not how reality really is. We are told that there is something, perhaps consciousness itself, connects us all to everyone and everything else. We are told that the world is not made up of isolated separate things but is rather a web of relationships. <laughs> 